Thank you. 
President McRobbie, Provost Robel, the candidates are assembled. We may now proceed with these commencement exercises. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome. As we begin this commencement ceremony, when Richards, the David H. Jacobs Bicentennial Dean of the Indiana University Jacobs School of Music will lead us in singing the National Anthem. After the National Anthem, the Reverend Scott McNeil, Associate Minister of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Bloomington, will offer the invocation. And will all who are able please stand or remain standing? As we gather here this morning, I invite you to pause, to take a deep breath, and be in this place made holy by all of our souls. Today is a blessed day unlike any other, and in this space we take a deep breath, taking in all of the work that got us thus far. However long ago you crossed the threshold into this community, whether rolling in a wheelchair, walking, or perhaps even dancing or scooting as you made your way onto campus, you stand at the precipice of another large moment, from student to graduate, beginning the next chapter of life. In this moment, we call upon all that we know to be holy. That is different for many people. The sacred is found in their ancestors throughout time and history, or a particular religious leader or scripture. For some, the sacred is found in the understanding that we as humans have both the power and the obligation to right the wrongs of the world. Wherever you find spirituality or truth, whether it be in science or religion or both, may it guide you out from sample gates, from assembly hall, into the world. May you be both changed and changing, loved and loving. This morning we invoke and call into this room all that we know to be holy, nature, humanity, spirit or God, deep love, and or a mystery never fully understood by our minds. May that hold us in this sacred space and help us to be fair and kind, holding truth while having an open mind so that we live lives that are just and whole. Amen. Please be seated. Before we begin our commencement ceremony, I ask you all to join me in remembering those Indiana University students 
whom we have lost in 2018, students who would have graduated this year from our university. Commencement is traditionally a joyous time when we celebrate all that our students have achieved in their studies at Indiana University and as they commence the rest of their lives. So I invite you to join me in a moment of silence in remembrance of those departed students and in sympathy for their families and friends. So again, would all who are able please stand once again. Thank you, and please be seated. Members of the class of 2018 and honored guests, welcome to the 189th commencement ceremony of Indiana University. We are especially pleased to acknowledge the many parents, wives, husbands, partners, relatives, and friends who have helped to make possible this day of achievement for all of our graduates and we share your pride in this celebration of accomplishment. Our ceremony today is but brief compared with the years of diligent study that each candidate has invested in his or her own educations. And we ask our guests to honor all of our graduates by remaining until the ceremony is concluded. Indiana University is proud of its long and distinguished history. We are proud to be supported by the people of Indiana dedicated to their education and to enhancing our state, our country, and the world. Seated on the platform are officers of the university and other special guests, and we are pleased that they have joined us for this occasion. You'll find their names listed in your program booklets. And I'm particularly pleased to introduce six members of the Board of Trustees of Indiana University, and I ask them to stand, and could you please hold your applause until all are standing. Joining us today are Patrick A. Shoulders of Evansville, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees, Mary Ellen K. Bishop of Carmel, Quinn Buckner of Bloomington, Harry L. Gonzo of Indianapolis, Donna B. Spears of Richmond, and Melanie S. Walker of Bloomington. Please join me in welcoming our trustees. Also with us today are a number of members of the faculty of Indiana University. Their outstanding scholarship, their dedication to teaching, and their commitment to their students have made this commencement possible. They have inspired our graduates in ways that will last a lifetime. So will all faculty who are present here today please stand for our recognition. All faculty. And I would also like to recognize the members of our outstanding staff who are with us this morning. And these tireless individuals help to make it possible for our students to succeed. So please join me in recognizing all of our staff present here today for all that they do for Indiana University. And finally, I ask our graduates to look around at your families and friends. All of us rely in countless ways on those who are near and dear to us. We depend on their helping hands and their faith that we will succeed. So graduates who are able, please stand up and join me in a big round of applause and recognition of your families and of your friends. Now, a great tradition at our commencement ceremonies is the awarding of honorary degrees, some of the highest accolades that Indiana University can bestow. I ask Dean Richards to escort today's candidate, Charles McKay, to the podium. Brian Horn, the University Grand Marshal, and Platform Marshal Sarah Mostis will assist.
Mr. President, it is a distinct pleasure to present Charles McKay for an honorary Indiana University degree. Mr. McKay is a distinguished leader in the cultural life of our nation. He led the Santa Fe Opera, a company with which he has had a long and storied history from 2008 until stepping down as its general director just a few weeks ago. In fact, Mr. McKay began volunteering with the Santa Fe Opera at the age of 15, as, a comfortable, as comfortable behind the scenes as performing the young Charles McKay could be found working in the administrative offices, in the orchestral library, and even in the scene shop. He would eventually hold multiple administrative positions with the company, even playing horn in the opera orchestra. The Spoleto Festival USA <coughs> would come next, where he served <coughs> as director <coughs> of finance and administration, and as manager of American musicians for the Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, Italy. Then would come his distinguished tenure with the Opera Theatre of St. Louis, first as executive director and then general director. There he expanded the company's endowment to 18 million, constructed the Levy Opera Center, renovated and enlarged its production facilities, expanded its education programs, and led the company on two tours to Japan. And then in 2008, he returned to the Santa Fe Opera where it all began as its general manager where he has doubled its net assets to 121 million, grown the operating budget by almost 50%, dramatically improved its capital assets, and built an education program that now serves over 50,000 children and adults annually. He has served on the board of Opera America for more than 30 years <clears throat> and as board president for five of those years. In 1997, <clears throat> he was the recipient of the Arts Management Career Service Award. He is president of the Sullivan Foundation, which supports young singers, and is a board member of the English Concert in America, and will serve this spring as a vocal judge for the International Tchaikovsky Competition. In his remarkable career, he has produced 184 main stage productions, 14 world premieres, nine by composers new to opera, seven American premieres, 20 San Francisco Santa Fe opera premieres, 76 Opera Theatre of St. Louis premieres, collaborative productions that have included IU, including most recently this fall, the collegiate premiere of The Revolution of Steve Jobs. And he has made possible the operatic debut of 425 singers, including many IU graduates, all the while garnering the admiration and gratitude of the profession. For his many accomplishments and his lifelong leadership, it is entirely fitting that Indiana University recognize Charles McKay with an Indiana University Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters degree. Charles McKay, Indiana University salute you. Your extraordinary achievements and your creative and collaborative spirit serve as an inspiration to all. And so, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Indiana University, I am proud and privileged to confer on you, with honor, the degree Doctor of Humane Letters with all attendant rights and privileges. Congratulations. Indiana University is delighted that Mr. McKay could be with us here today, and we're also honored that his partner, Cam McCluskey, and Maria Schlafly, a former colleague from the Opera Theatre of St. Louis, who is now Executive Director of the Sullivan Foundation, uh, have been able to join us this morning. So please join me in greeting Mr. McKay's guests as well. Now, on this occasion, I am very honored to present the University Medal to a highly distinguished member of the Indiana University community, the Indiana University faculty, 
and a lifelong public servant. The University Medal is awarded very rarely in recognition of extraordinary con contributions to Indiana University or to humanity at large, contributions of the very highest order. Made of gold in the image of the University seal, the University Medal is awarded to honour truly exceptional achievements. In fact, it has only been awarded 18 times previously in the whole history of the University. I now ask Lauren Rebell, Provost of Indiana University Bloomington and Executive Vice President of Indiana University to escort the recipient to the podium, the Honourable Lee H. Hamilton. President McRobbie, it is an honor <clears throat> to present the Honorable Lee H. Hamilton for a university medal. Mr. Hamilton, a graduate of Indiana University, is one of the nation's foremost experts on the United States Congress, as well as a revered member of the IU faculty and a true American hero. Mr. Hamilton had a long and illustrious career in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he served as the congressman from Indiana's 9th District from 1965 to 1999. He founded the Indiana University Center on Representative Government in 1999 and served as its director until 2015. He also served as president and director of the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. A leading figure on foreign policy, intelligence, and national security, Mr. Hamilton served as vice chair of the 9-11 Commission and co-chair of the bipartisan Iraq Study Group. He also served as co-chair of the U.S. Department of Energy's Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future and as a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. He is currently a member of the President's Homeland Security Advisory Council. He is a prolific writer on public affairs issues, and his books include how Congress Works and Why You Should Care, Strengthening Congress, and Congress, Presidents, and American Politics. Mr. Hamilton received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from then U.S. President Barack Obama in 2015, and he is a co-recipient of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Patriot Award. He currently serves as a professor of practice and a distinguished scholar in the IU School of Public and Environmental Affairs and as a distinguished scholar and prof professor of practice in IU's Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies, which was named earlier this year in his honor and in honor of former U.S. Senator Richard Luger of Indiana who was also on the IU faculty. For his many unparalleled accomplishments, it is wholly fitting that Indiana University recognize the Honorable Lee H. Hamilton with the University Medal. Lee H. Hamilton, Indiana University salutes you. Your enduring commitment to improving and protecting democracy and your unwavering support of public affairs scholarship serve as an inspiration to us all. And thus, I am proud and privileged to acknowledge your lifetime of remarkable achievement to this country and to the world with the University Medal.
But it is, of course, a great honour to welcome Congressman Hamilton this morning. And we are also honoured that his daughters, Deb Kramer and Tracy Souza, his son-in-law, Matt Souza, his son, Doug Hamilton, and his partner, Michael Field, his nephew, Judge David Hamilton, and his wife, Inga Van Kruis, and his nephew, Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton, and his wife, Dawn Johnson, have all been able to join us this morning. So please join me in also greeting Congress Hamilton's guests as well. Now I'm very pleased to introduce today's commencement speaker, David M. Rubenstein, who is a co-founder and co-executive chair of the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest private equity firms. Since its founding in 1987, Carlyle has grown into a firm managing $212 billion from 31 offices around the world. A native of Baltimore, Mr. Rubenstein graduated magna cum laude from Duke University, where he was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. He also graduated from the University of Chicago Law School, where he was editor of the University of Chicago Law Review. In addition, in, in addition to practicing with law firms in New York City and Washington, D.C., Mr. Rubenstein has served as chief counsel to the U.S. Senate's Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments and as deputy assistant to U.S. President Jimmy Carter for domestic policy. He serves on the boards of some of the nation's most influential and important organizations, including, and this is only a small sampling, the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, the Smithsonian Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations, all of which he chairs, as well as the National Gallery of Art, the University of Chicago, Harvard University, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and many others. Mr. Rubenstein is one of the original signers of the Giving Pledge. This is a commitment by the world's most financially successful individuals and families to dedicate the majority of their wealth to giving back. He practices in part what he calls patriotic philanthropy, that is, purchasing documents of major historic importance and making them available on permanent loan to the US government or to historic sites, and making philanthropic donations that support such historic landmarks and national cultural institutions, such as the Washington Monument and the National Zoo. He purchased, for example, the last privately owned copy of the Magna Carta and lent it to the National Archives in Washington, DC. He is a recipient of the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy, and he hosts the David Rubenstein Show on Bloomberg TV and on PBS. And last spring in Washington, DC, he helped launch the Global Indices of Philanthropy, now produced annually by IU's Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our commencement speaker, David Rubenstein. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and I know when my eulogy is ready to be given, I know who I want to have give that eulogy. Thank you very much. Uh, lower your expectations. I'm not nearly as good as that introduction. The tradition of commencement speakers goes back several hundred years, and for several hundred years, the people who are listening commencement speakers uh, cannot remember what they say five or ten minutes after the speech is over. So I do not expect you to remember what I'm going to say. Uh, for my own commencement at Duke University in 1970, I couldn't remember what the speaker said five minutes after it was over. I couldn't figure out who actually he was. I could not figure out how he was actually selected. And some of you may be wondering how I was selected, because I did not go to Indiana University. I haven't spent as much time in the state as I should have. And so you might be wondering, how do you get to be a commencement speaker at IU? How many of you have been wondering this? Ready? Yes. Okay. Well, I've been wondering myself, how did I get selected? So the truth is, uh, I do have a daughter graduating uh, this year, and I'm very proud of that. But there are many people who are, where is she? Where is my daughter? Somewhere. Um, so I'm very proud of that. But there are many people, there she is, there are many people who um, are graduating whose parents are far more prominent than me and would be better speakers than me. So why did I get picked? Well, here's my theory. Uh, about 40-some years ago, there was a senator from Indiana named Birch Bayh. His son later became a senator as well. And I became his chief counsel. Now, at the time, I was attracted to that because I had a desire to go work in the White House. I thought Birch Bayh would be a president of the United States. He was running, getting ready to run for president. And uh, 
and I thought I'd be his chief counsel in the Senate, and then, you know, a few months later, he'd be president, I'd be the chief counsel of the White House. I thought that was pretty good for somebody 25 years old. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, um, 30 days after I joined Senator Bayh's operation, he dropped out of the presidential campaign. And I think it was because he realized that people recognized that if he hired somebody as inadequate as me to be his chief counsel, he wasn't qualified to be president. So in a, out of embarrassment, he dropped out. And um, basically, I thought that perhaps that was the reason that I was selected, because I had that Indiana connection for, you know, 30 days or so. But actually, I realized it was more than that. It was desire to show all of you that you can fail in life, and actually, maybe life can work out. Because after my experience, and before my experience with Senator Bayh, my best experience in life was in failing. Let me explain what I mean. When I graduated from law school, I went to practice law in New York, and very quickly the client said, well, you're not a very good lawyer, and my partner said, you know, you really went to law school? Do you really know what you're doing? And I realized I wasn't that good a lawyer, and they kind of suggested I do something else. I went to work for Senator Bai, and he quickly got embarrassed that I was working for him, and he dropped out of the presidential campaign out of embarrassment that I was a chief counsel. I then went to work for another man who was running for president of the United States. His name was Jimmy Carter. And when I joined his campaign, he was 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford. And when I was finished with my work, Jimmy Carter won by one point. So I didn't exactly help him that much. But as we have learned many times, uh, White House staffs are filled on who worked in the campaign. So at the age of 27, I became the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States. I obviously wasn't qualified for that, but I you know, wasn't qualified for any jobs I'd had. So I, I got this job. I'm in the West Wing. And one of my responsibilities was to fight inflation, and I got it to 19 percent, uh, a record not matched since then. But people used to tell me how great I was, and um, I said, uh, I, you know, you want to get a job? Call me. Well, I said, I don't want a job because I'm going to be working uh, in the second term of Jimmy Carter because I'll be the senior domestic advisor. And I know we're going to do that because we're going to run against an old, old, old man who's too old to run for president, and we certainly will beat him. His name was Ronald Reagan, and he was 69 years old. Uh, that is exactly the age I am today. So today, 69 doesn't seem like so old. It seems like a teenager to me today. But we lost to Ronald Reagan. So I did what many people do in Washington. All the people told me how brilliant I was and how great I was when I was a White House aide. I called them up and said, OK, now's your chance to really hire me. And none of them called me back. Because when you're out of power in Washington, you're a dead man. As Harry Truman said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. And so I couldn't get a job. So I've been a White House advisor. I'm riding around on Air Force One, going to Marine One, Camp David, advising the president. In fact, I advised him on his famous debate with Ronald Reagan. Uh, we had one debate. I was in charge of debate preparations, and as you may know, I failed because Carter got clobbered in the debate. So all these things had added up to a lot of failure, but I figured, okay, I'll go practice law eventually, but I couldn't get a job. And I was trying to explain to my mother, why is it that a White House aide can't get a job practicing law? Well, I said I had so many offers, I didn't know which one to take. But it went on. January, February, March, April, May, June, no offers. Finally, somebody felt sorry for me. They gave me an offer. I started at the bottom again, and very quickly they said, you know, did you really go to law school? Do you know what you're doing? And so I failed again. And so basically my life was a matter of failure, complete failure. And so I think that I was given this assignment today to show all of you that you can turn around your life a bit. I failed for most of my life, and then I got lucky. Uh, I got kicked out of the practice of law once again because my partners and clients said I was no good. And I started a little private equity firm in Washington, D.C. at the age of 37. And I did it then because I read that an entrepreneur will start his or her first uh, entrepreneurial venture uh, between the age of 28 and 37. And I read that when I was 37. I said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. So I did it. And I got lucky by hiring some good people that knew what they were doing. And then I got lucky and I got involved in the philanthropy world. But the reason that I have been selected, I suspect, is that I failed a lot in life, and failing is a very important thing. And so I have been surprised um, that I've been asked to speak, but I really realize now it probably isn't because I've succeeded in the business world, and it's not because I've succeeded in the philanthropy world. It's because of something that happened to me relatively recently. Um, I've spent now 40 years in business and 40 years in philanthropy. But a few years ago, somebody came along and said, would you like to have a TV show? 
Well, you interviewed people. And I said, okay, I, I can figure out how to do that. I failed at other things. I can fail at this. Sure, I'll try. And so I started doing this. It's on TV. It was the immodestly named David Rubenstein Show. And I started interviewing people, and I realized that um, I enjoy it, and I realized I may have spent most of my career doing the wrong thing. Maybe I should have been an interviewer. And so now what I'd like to do is to imagine what I would be like if I was in your position today, and I'm sitting there and saying, okay, I would like to interview David Rubenstein from the position of being a, a graduate today. So what would be the questions that I would ask David Rubenstein if I were sitting where you are and if I was using the interview skills that I have acquired recently? So let me give you 10 questions that I would think that you should ask me or that I would ask myself, and I'll give you my very frank answers. First, what is the way, and I should tell you this, I'm going to give you some of the secrets of life. Um, I don't want to tell you in 10 minutes the secrets of life because you will feel that you wasted your time here getting the degree working hard. Um, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about successful and being successful in life in 10 minutes, okay? In 10 questions. So first the question is, how does one achieve professional success? Well, I, I, clearly failing is helpful. Failing is helpful because if you don't fail, you'll never learn how to be successful. Uh, a native of Indiana, the Chief Justice of the United States, he gave a commencement address last year to the ninth grade graduating class of his son. And he said to all these ninth grade uh, boys, I hope all of you fail, because if you fail in life, you will learn how to be successful. And I say the same to all of you. If you really want to be successful in life, try to figure out how to do something that's risky, adventuresome, out of your normal skill set, because if you learn how to fail in something, ultimately you will learn how to succeed. If you take anybody you admire and look at their career, whatever they've achieved, they've achieved it after they've failed. So I encourage all of you, and your parents, please don't listen to this, but ignore your parents. Do what you want. Experiment. My mother wanted me to be a dentist, and I had to convince her that I was going to get arthritis in my fingers, and I couldn't be a dentist. So. You don't listen to what your parents want. They're terrific, and I'll talk about them in a moment. But do what you want. You have to live your life and try different things. Experiment. Nobody ever won a Nobel Prize hating what they're doing. You have to love what you're doing, but you have to find the things that you're going to love, and it's going to take time. I didn't find it until I was 37, many years after I graduated. So think about different things. Experiment. If you want professional success, try something out of your comfort zone, and then persevere persevere, persevere. Everybody that you might admire, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, anybody who's a political figure, social figure, um, art, artist, they failed a lot, they tried, they persevered, they overcome objections. So think about that. Think of what you can do to overcome objections and persevere, persevere, and persist. Secondly, how many, pe well, how many people uh, here do not have a job yet? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you brought your resumes with you? Okay. How does one, the second question I would ask is, how do you get a job? This is the hardest thing in life in many ways. There's no perfect way to do it, but my advice is if you want to get a job, you have to be persistent. You have to figure out how you can get to the person that is going to interview you, figure out what contacts make a difference, send in letters, send in emails, use all your contacts, eventually you'll get an interview if you're persistent. Not arrogant, not obnoxious, but be persistent. And when you get in the interview, don't make the mistake that many people do when they interview with me. I've interviewed several thousand people over the years. I've hired hundreds of people, and I always hire people that are people that come looking like they're ready for a job, they're not disheveled, people that come asking questions I'm amazed at how many people will come and they come for an interview and I say to them, do you have any questions? They say, I have no questions. If you have no questions, you probably shouldn't get hired. Think of some questions. Make up questions. Do something that makes it look like you're interested. Don't ask for the salary. When you ask what the salary is, that, that's the wrong question. But be presentable and follow up. Send a follow-up letter. Ask people. Persist and use your contacts. Eventually, you'll get a job. And remember, the first job doesn't have to be the best job you're going to get. Just get a job. Um, how many of you expect to be going back and living in your parents' homes after you graduate today? Anybody? How many of the parents want this to happen? Okay. You know, it used to be when your kids came home, um, you would try to get them out of the house after a while. You would like them when they were little, but you don't want them back. Um, it used to be the case that you would say to your kids, go get an internship 
unpaid, you can live in the house for a while, just get them out of the house. Now the, what you need to do is often pay somebody to take your kid as an intern. And how many parents are willing to pay somebody to take their kids as an intern just to get them out of the house? A couple of them. Okay. So when you're interviewing for a job, be ready to interview. Don't come there disheveled, looking like you don't know what you're doing. Be polite. Follow up. Do what you would want if somebody was interviewing with you. Third question. How important is luck in life? Well, the truth is, I got very lucky in my life. My parents didn't graduate from college. They didn't graduate from high school. I didn't have a, a wealthy family to help me in many ways. I got very lucky. But as Benjamin Franklin said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And so, yes, luck is very important in life. Many of you are here because you made a contact. You, you, you got a, um, a job if you got it because you might have made a contact somewhere. You had some luck. Luck is important. But if you're going to get anywhere in the world, you have to work hard. There is no substitute for that. So apply yourself. You don't need to be a complete workaholic and do nothing else, but apply yourself. Nothing has ever accomplished a great moment nine to five, five days a week. You've got to do something more than that if you really get somewhere in life. But you have to recognize that luck will play a big role in it, and you will have a lot of bad luck. If you don't have any bad luck, you're not trying. You need some bad luck in order to ultimately get good luck. But remember, as Benjamin Franklin said, the harder you work, the, luck the luckier you can be. Now that I'm graduating, the next question would be, do I need to read all these things that I've been reading before? I'm sick of all these reading assignments I had. The truth is, you need to read more. You need to read more. When I was a young boy, my parents couldn't afford to buy books for me, so they took me to a library and got a library card at six years old, and you were allowed to take out 12 books a week. I read all 12 books in, in, in the, first, the first day, and I had to wait another uh, week before I could take out more books. But books became, and reading became, my way out of the environment in which I grew up. And there is no substitute for reading. You have to read. And I believe that uh, it is a sad commentary that 30% of college graduates never read another book in their life. Never read another book. Now, I don't read, regard reading tweets as reading. Reading emails is not reading. Reading books focuses the mind. I try to read 100 books a year. Now, that's obsessive, perhaps. But I try to read because you can, your brain is a muscle and you have to exercise it. And if you think that today you're an educated person, you're wrong. You are really just a kindergarten. You are now in the chance to compete in the real world, and if you're going to compete in the real world, you're going to be competing with people who are reading a lot, know a lot more than you, and the only way to play catch up is to read, 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 and read more and more books. And do not forget that. Illiteracy is a big problem in this country. 14% of our country is functionally illiterate. They can't read past the fourth grade level. But there's a big problem called illiteracy, where people who can read choose not to do so. Do not allow yourself to do that. Read, read, read. What about, uh, the next question is, um, I notice a lot of people succeed in life by cutting ethical corners. Why should I not do that and to get ahead? Uh, there's no doubt that there's some people that get ahead in life. You might become a very, very famous person by cutting ethical corners, but that's not the life you want to lead. What you want to do is never have to worry about your reputation. It takes a lifetime to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. So in your life, you will be tempted to cut corners to get ahead, to make money, to get a better job, to do things that might make you feel better for a while. But in the end, if you do that, you're going to have to always worry whether somebody's going to come along and realize what you've done, and ultimately you could spend your time in, in jail. Nobody there you here wants to spend their time in jail. Do not ever worry about your future if you are uh, not cutting ethical corners. Do not cut ethical corners. Your reputation is the most important thing you carry around with you, and do not cut ethical corners, because in the end, somebody will find out, and somebody will do something that will be harmful to you, your family. You don't want to embarrass your family, your children, your associates. Do not cut ethical corners. Walk away from the temptations, and you'll have many temptations to cut ethical corners. Avoid those temptations. Next question is, should I be a leader or a follower? Well, you can go through life and be a follower. Most people in life, there's seven and a half billion people on the face of the earth, and to be honest, many of them are followers. There's nothing wrong with that. You can lead a happy life. You can do what Thomas Jefferson called the pursuit of happiness without being a, uh, a, a, a leader. But I think lead, being a leader provides much greater pleasure out of life, and you can all be leaders. If you have a degree from this university, you can be a leader in your chosen field, whatever ultimately it, it, it turns out to be. But to be a leader, you have to lead. And there are three great ways to lead, and try to perfect this. Number one, 
learn, learn how to persuade people. That's the most important thing. Leadership is about persuading people to do what you want. In all of life, what you have to do is persuade somebody to do what you want, and if you can persuade them, then you're going to likely be a leader. So how do you persuade people? Three ways. Number one, learn how to write. It's amazing how many people graduate from great colleges, great universities, high schools, and they can't write very well. You have a degree now, but most likely you're not a perfected great writer. But you have a chance to learn how to write now. Keep writing, perfecting it by writing over and over again. You can persuade people by a good writing style. Secondly, learn how to persuade people by oral communications. Many great people have been not great writers, but they've been great communicators orally. Learn how to be a speaker. Practice. Get an invitation to speak. Speak as much as you can. And third, the most important way to be a leader is to lead by example. When George Washington was in Valley Forge in 1777, he was with his troops. He didn't have to be there. He could have stayed at the Ritz-Carlton equivalent down the road. But he stayed with his troops because he wanted to lead by example, and they followed him. So lead by example. If you want people to follow you, lead by your example. What are the two most important words in the English language? Thank you. It is amazing how many people forget these words, but there is no limit to what you can get if you're willing to say thank you. As Ronald Reagan famously said, there is no limit to what you can accomplish if you're willing to share the credit. Thank other people. None of you got here on your own. Everybody had somebody help you, a parent, a guardian, a relative, a grandmother, a friend. Today is obviously a day where you thank them, but don't thank them just today. Thank them repeatedly throughout life and thank the people that help you day to day. And I particularly want to thank, uh, and I think you should thank your parents. In my case, my parents um, didn't have an education, they didn't have very much money, but they gave the, me the only thing that parents can really give to a child that's really valuable, which is unconditional love. And your parents, no doubt, have given you unconditional love, and you should thank them today, but thank them repeatedly. In my own case, I made a mistake. As I was moving forward in life, my parents were proud of what I achieved, but I didn't really do anything to honor them. And my father died early, earlier than I expected, and I realized I should have done something to honor him. So he was a Marine, and so ultimately I redid the Iwo Jima Memorial in his honor in Washington, D.C., but I realized I'd made a terrible mistake in not doing it while he was alive. I should have done something sooner. And so my mother was still alive, and I... I did something in her honor in Washington, D.C., and I brought her to see it, and I surprised her and saw her name on it, and she cried, and she was so happy that I'd honor her in that way, and she sadly passed away just about a month later. So if you're going to honor your parents, do it while they're alive, and do it throughout your life. Don't just wait till the end. Role models. Who should be your role model? Who was my role model? Well, when I was younger, when I was six or seven, I thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. I didn't realize people who are Jewish couldn't be professional baseball players. They could be professional baseball owners, maybe, but not players. So at six or seven, my role model was Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. But at the age of uh, eight, I realized I had peaked in my athletic career and wasn't likely to be a major baseball league player. So I then said, well, I'll do something easier than being a major league baseball player. I'll be president of the United States. So my role model was John Kennedy. But then I realized he was handsome, charming, polished, all the things I wasn't, and so I said, okay, I'm not going to be President of the United States. So I picked a role model, and it was a role model that came to me when I was in the sixth grade. In the sixth grade, John Kennedy gave us a great inaugural address, the greatest inaugural address of the 20th century, where he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The man that really wrote that speech was a brilliant 31-year-old speechwriter from Nebraska who was taught John Kennedy's top eight. His name was Ted Sorensen, and I took him as a role model of being an advisor to a president because I realized I wasn't going to be president. And I went to work for him, and he was a role model for me for many, many years. And I recently lost a person who became a role model to me as well, and his name was George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, the recently deceased President of the United States, uh, he joined my firm about 25 years ago and became a very good, after he left his presidency, very good friend and advisor to me. And I think all of you should consider him as a role model, a person who was decent, patriotic, committed to family, committed to God, a person who couldn't do enough for other people. He's the kind of role model that you should look at and read about his life. There's an excellent book written about him by John Meacham on, on, on uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Read that book because he has the kind of qualities that all of you should want to have. And there are many other role models that you should have, and I'll just mention a couple others who are graduates of this university. And these, they sat exactly where you're sitting now a few years ago. One of them was James Watson, 
the man who really discovered what life is all about in many ways, the, the DNA. He was the co-discoverer of DNA, a PhD graduate from Indiana University. The man whose scientific achievement was probably the most important scientific achievement of the 20th century. Another man is Bob Gates, probably the most effective Secretary of Defense our country's ever had, serving in a Democratic and Republican administration, a graduate and a master's degree from Indiana University. And then my former boss, Birch Bayh. Birch Bayh was elected to the United States Senate from Indiana when he was 34 years old. He wrote two constitutional amendments. One is the 25th Amendment, which we've been reading about li lately, and secondly, one that enabled all of you to have the right to vote. He lowered the age of voting from 21 to 18 as a constitutional amendment. He also wrote the ERA, which didn't become law but had a big effect on the law. And so he was a man who wrote the Constitution, wrote more constitutional amendments than anybody from the founding father, and he's a graduate of Indiana University. Joshua Bell, the greatest violinist in the world, a graduate of your, the Jacobs Music School and also a professor here. He's a person who's a role model because he's a perfectionist. He took one set of skills and made himself the best in the world. Quinn Buckner, who is behind me today. Where's Quinn? Quinn Buckner, right there. There's a role model. Here's a man who was the, one of the only seven people in, in our country's history to be an NCAA champion of basketball, Olympic champion, an NBA champion, but a great role model since his career as a basketball player and obviously a trustee here as well. And let me mention a woman that I have come to know as a graduate of, of uh, IU as well. Her name is Patty Stonecipher. She was an early employee at a company called Microsoft. And she ultimately rose up and was asked by Bill Gates to run his foundation. She created the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and ran it for 10 years. She also was asked to serve on another board that was starting in Seattle, a company called Amazon. And she was an original board member, and now she's an advisor to Jeff Bezos on philanthropy. She serves as the chairman of the Smithsonian, and now she runs Martha's Table, which is a food bank and a low-income assistance organization in Washington, D.C. A real role model because she's given back to society. All of these people sat where you sit now, and they are role models. They're graduates of IU, and you too, you too can use your IU degree to become a role model for other people, and I hope you'll do that. Next question is, how do I give back to society? And should I give back to society? Well, you can have a very happy life, making some money, uh, doing nothing to help other people, but in the end, you will, I assure you, feel much more uh, useful in your life if you're helping other people. In my own case, when I made some money, I thought it was nice, but I realized the greatest pleasure in my life is giving away the money. And I want to remind people that you say, well, you don't have any money to give away, you can't give, back, give it back. Philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't mean rich people writing checks. You can love humanity with your time, your energy, your ideas, and your time is your most valuable commodity. So you can help other people by giving back to society through your time, your energy ideas, if you don't have money. And I think you will feel, in the end, that doing so will be beneficial to you. And I'll tell you one selfish way you should consider giving back to society. People that give back to society live longer because they're happier. When people give away scholarship money, people work at a food bank, they don't say, I hate myself for giving away scholarship money, I hate myself for feeding young kids. They like themselves. They feel happier. Grumpy people don't live as long. Happy people live longer. So if you want to selfishly think about it this way, give back to society, you'll be happy about yourself and you'll live longer. And I have it on good authority that there's a special place in heaven for people that give back to society. So you'll live a longer life and when your time does come, you'll have a special place in heaven. So think about what you can do to give back to society and do something useful with your life. You can obviously walk through life without giving back to society. But in the end, you want to make the world a better place. And that's the last question I will address. And that question is, should I make a difference in the world? And what's the point of it? Well, nobody really knows why we're on, put on the face of the earth. You can have religious reasons, evolutionary reasons. Why are we on the face of the earth? Nobody really knows. But surely there is some point to trying to make the world a better place and to making a difference in the world, making it better than you found it. The ancient Greeks used to say, find a way to make this world a better place than you found it. And you should think about that the same. How can you make the world a better place? Well, what you can do is find one narrow area, perhaps, where you are interested in something, find it, perfect it, learn that area, and try to give back in that area. And ultimately, you might find out you're changing the world. A young graduate of Princeton uh, came up with the idea of Teach for America. She didn't have any money. She came up with the idea that's made a difference in, in the world and the United States as well. So think of what you can do that makes a difference in the world. And you have a special responsibility for this reason. Indiana University is one of the great universities in, in our country. And it's a terrific university, but for the rest of your life, 
you will now have its name on you. Now you can change your the way you look in the rest of your life. You can change your name, you can change your profession, you can change anything practically. One thing you will not be able to change the rest of your life is where you got your degrees. And you got it from Indiana University. And you should wear that proudly. You should be feeling that as a Hoosier you have a special responsibility. The university and the people of Indiana have invested a lot of time, energy, and money in you. And you should pay them back by not only being a responsible citizen, making the world a better place, doing something that justifies your existence on the face of the earth. And ultimately, the university will repay you because the university will be a place that you can be proud. But you should be proud to be call yourself an IU uh, graduate and a Hoosier. And I think if you do this, two things can happen. One, you might be invited to get a television interview show one day. <laughs> two, you might be invited to be a commencement speaker, provided you failed a lot before you got along the way. Now, there's one person who sent me a letter today that I'll read and close with. Um, this person is a person who also benefited from being in Indiana. And let me read you this letter. To the new graduates of IU, 13 score and eight years ago, I left the state of Indiana, but I always regarded myself as a Hoosier. Another state later claimed I was its product and its son, but I always knew that whatever I became was due to the education I received from the good people of Indiana. And I always knew that once a Hoosier, always a Hoosier. So I hope you will view your life, whatever you do, whatever you become, wherever you live, and however long you do live, as I did mine, a proud Hoosier. And I hope you will also remember what the people of Indiana did to help you get a world-class education. So please resolve with me that you will well note and long remember that a solid education in Indiana of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from this earth. Congratulations on your new degrees, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Rubenstein, in particular for that late-breaking news in the letter that you just received as well. <laughs> and your insights, your, your words of encouragement and your experience from a remarkable career, I'm sure will have lasting value for everybody who's joined us today for this memorable occasion. I'm also very pleased to welcome your daughter, uh, Gabrielle Rubenstein, who has joined us today. She is graduating today with an MBA from IU's Kelly School of Business as part of a dual degree program with Purdue University in Food and Agri-Business Management. Please join me in welcoming her as well. Now a time-honored tradition of our commencement ceremonies is the induction of the graduating class into the Alumni Association of Indiana University. To induct our newest graduates, Trustee Shoulders will represent the university, and Robert N. Johnson, Chair of the IU Alumni Association, will represent the alumni. And Alex Wisniewski, President of the Indiana University Student Association, will represent the student body. Alex is a senior from Munster, Indiana, majoring in business. Now, will all members of the graduating class who are able please stand? Trusty shoulders. Inscribed upon this scroll are the names of every member of the graduating class of 2018. I request that each name be formally added to the list of alumni of Indiana University. Thank you, Mr. Wesniewski. Mr. Johnson, the trustees of Indiana University are proud to present these graduates for admission into the IU Alumni Association. They join approximately 700,000 living IU graduates who reside in all 50 states and more than 150 countries around the world. We know that these, those graduating here today will continue to enhance the worldwide reputation of Indiana University and bring great distinction and honor 
to our alma mater. Graduates, you are the pride of Indiana University. Hail to old IU. Trustee Shoulders, thank you. We accept and welcome the members of the graduating class of 2018 into the Indiana University Alumni Association. Who, who, who's yours? <laughs> class of 2018, we are confident that you will enrich our lives by your personal example and the high standards you bring to all that you do. IU depends on you maintaining its tradition of excellence. I challenge each of you to support your university, your alumni association, and your country with your time and talent. Thank you very much. Go IU. Please be seated. And to the class of 2018, I also offer congratulations on your induction into the Indiana University Alumni Association. Trustees, Provost Rebell, Congressman Hamilton, Mr. Rubenstein, Mr. McKay, honored guests, colleagues, and members of the class of 2018. Half a century ago, the great political philosopher Hannah Arendt asked in her famous essay on truth and politics, do facts independent of opinion and interpretation exist at all? She went on, though, to answer this question most emphatically in the affirmative. Arendt argued that while events are open to interpretation, there is no excuse for blurring the dividing lines between fact, opinion, and interpretation. She wrote, even if we admit that every generation has the right to write its own history, we do not admit the right to touch the factual material itself. In other words, facts do exist and are beyond argument, debate, or opinion, and truth does matter. But it is claimed we live today, as we hear on almost a daily basis, in a post-truth era. It is the indictment of our age. Indeed, we have witnessed in recent years a disturbing and increasingly widespread casual attitude towards the truth. We have seen rampant attacks on established knowledge and open hostility to verifiable facts. We have seen a fundamental rejection in some quarters of dispassionate rationality. And we have seen political upheaval around the globe driven by wild claims and spurious statistics. And we have seen attacks on journalists who seek to report the truth and challenge corruption as was underscored just this week when Time magazine named as the 2018 Person of the Year a group of journalists who have been targeted, jailed, and in some cases killed for reporting their work. In sharp contrast to this chilling abandonment of reason, for nearly 200 years, Indiana University, as a great educational and research institution, has stood and will always stand for truth. Truth unembellished by artifice or equivocation. And while events are open to interpretation, and while we should revere as a virtue the ability to change one's mind in the face of new factual evidence, there is no excuse for blurring the dividing lines between fact, opinion, and interpretation. Truth is an elemental component of our moral and ethical systems. Telling the truth is regarded as a fundamental part of our relations with other people, not just for its pragmatic utility, but as a good in itself. It is something we are taught from the earliest age. For thousands of years, truth has been a topic of the deepest inquiry by the greatest minds from every human culture and civilization. The search for what is true knowledge is an underlying theme of all of Plato's works. In Plato's Republic, Socrates argues that it is impossible to find anything more akin to wisdom than truth. The Chinese philosopher Kong Zhi, better known as Confucius, wrote in his Analects that the object of the superior person is truth. To England's first poet laureate, John Dryden, truth is the foundation of all knowledge and the cement of all societies. 
In today's complex world, the rigorous search for truth takes many forms. Embracing truth in our daily lives is not, as philosopher Martha Nussbaum has observed, merely a matter of gathering factual knowledge and utilising logic. Responsible global citizenship in the 21st century, she writes, requires the ability to assess historical evidence, to use and think critically about economic principles, to assess accounts of social justice, to speak a foreign language, to appreciate the complexities of major world religions. In other words, responsible global citizenship requires an education that includes the arts and the humanities. Many of you have received such an education during your time here at Indiana University. It has been an education both wide-ranging and selectively deep, in logic and reason, in the analytical and the beautiful, in the past and in the, pre and the present. It is a broad education in a wide range of subjects that are central to understanding the human experience. It is an education that aspires to truth. Those of you who graduate today with advanced degrees have focused in your time at IU on disciplines that are concerned with particular truths, with discrete facts and inferences supported by these facts. And as you have undoubtedly learned, professionals in business, law and the sciences must also embrace the arts and humanities for their value in helping us to better understand what it means to be human and to grapple with complex moral issues. Your IU education has given you the knowledge, values and habits of mind to distinguish reality from appearance, to evaluate the trustworthiness of sources, to understand what constitutes a valid argument and to assess the evidence used to support a claim. These same habits of mind will enable you to contribute in immensely important, transformative and innovative ways to the prosperity and progress of this nation and the world, just as all three of our distinguished guests today Mr. Rubenstein, Mr. McKay, and Congressman Hamilton have done through their long and distinguished careers. You, the members of the class of 2018, are superbly prepared from one of America's great research universities to confront the challenges of the 21st century and to continue IU's tradition of the dedicated and unremitting search for truth. The range of your achievements at Indiana University is testimony to the time that you invested so diligently in your education and to all that you have learned. IU's Bloomi IU Bloomington's winter class of 2018 includes graduates from 58 different countries, from 45 states and the District of Columbia, and from 64 of Indiana's 92 counties. Our oldest graduate today is 62, and our youngest, 20. And among And among today's graduates are two sets of twins. Many members of the class of 2018 have helped to improve the quality of life for citizens of this country and for people around the world during their time as students at Indiana University. More than a third of you have traveled around the world for your studies, embracing the world in all its diversity and not shunning it or closing it off. Many of you have helped to raise money for IU scholarships through your participation in one of our great traditions, the Little 500. And you have raised record amounts in support of the Riley Hospital for Children through your participation in and leadership of the IU Dance Marathon, one of the largest student philanthropic events at any university in this country. More than 15% of IU Bloomington students have been involved in this event at some point in their college career. This year, the IU Dance Marathon raised nearly $4.2 million, marking the third consecutive year that has raised more than $4 million for Raleigh. <laughs> this is a remarkable achievement that will benefit countless children and families who receive treatment at one of the nation's leading pediatric hospitals. And great credit is due to all of the students who work so hard to make this event such a stunning success. The great American thinker Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that it is not enough to search for truth, one must also uphold it with the greatest of energy and diligence. Wherever truth is injured, Emerson wrote, defend it. As graduates of Indiana University, you have been preparing for years to become the next generation to discover, to understand and to apply all that you have learned. 
As you leave this ceremony and begin to use the knowledge and skills that you have acquired to become the leaders of tomorrow, I call on you to renew your commitment to be the standard bearers of truth. Bolstered by the motto of your alma mater, Lux et Veritas, Light and Truth, may you appreciate and tirelessly defend the truths that we now possess. And may you, in this post-truth era, speak for truth and defend it against those who would distort, discredit and defame it. Congratulations and best wishes again to the class of 2018. It is now my pleasure to ask Provost Rebel to come forward to announce the candidates for degrees. Please welcome Provost Rebel to the podium. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. We now come to the central moment of today's ceremony. Here, in the presence of the trustees, the faculty, your families, and your friends, the candidates will be presented for the conferral of their degrees. The names of the candidates are listed in your program booklets. Some candidates have been awarded honors in general scholarship. Those students are wearing cream and crimson cords of distinction on their shoulders and their distinctions are noted in your program books. In addition, some students have been members of the Hutton Honors College, and they have earned with their degrees the general honors notation. This notation signifies the successful completion of a particularly challenging general education curriculum. Indiana University holds all of its graduates in high esteem and takes an added measure of pride in those who have excelled academically. Therefore, I ask the candidates who are graduating with the general honors notation to please stand and remain standing. And I ask those who are graduating with distinction, high distinction, and highest distinction to stand and remain standing. Finally, I ask those candidates who are wearing cords that indicate their attainment of departmental or school honors or membership in honor societies to please stand. Please join me in congratulating all of these candidates. Please be seated. Our graduating students who are veterans or are currently in the U.S. Armed Forces are wearing red, white, and blue cords today. I ask them to please stand. Please accept our deepest thanks and congratulations. Please be seated. The deans of the schools will now present the candidates for degrees. President McRobbie will formally confer degrees after all of the candidates have been introduced. I begin by asking James C. Wimbush, Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs, and Dean of the University Graduate School, to come forward to present candidates for degrees. Will candidates for the degrees Master of Arts, Master of Fine Arts, and Master of Science please stand? Will candidates for the degree Doctor of Philosophy please stand? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations.
Please be seated. Next, I ask Larry D. Singel, Executive Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, to come forward to present candidates for degrees. Good morning, College of Arts and Sciences. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the College of Arts and Sciences please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degrees in the College of Arts and Sciences please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the College of Arts and Sciences please stand? These candidates meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. I now ask Peg Feynman, founding dean of the School of Art, Architecture, and Design, to present candidates for degrees. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the School of Art, Architecture, and Design please stand and remain standing? Will candidates for master's degrees in the School of Art, Architecture, and Design please stand? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. I now ask Lee Feinstein, founding dean of the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies to present candidates for degrees. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the newly named Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies Please stand and remain standing. Will the candidates for master's degrees in the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies please stand and remain standing? And will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies please stand and remain standing? These candidates meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees, congratulations. Please be seated. Thank you. I now ask James Shanahan, founding dean of the Media School, to present candidates for degrees. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the media school please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degrees in the media school please stand and remain standing? And will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the media school please stand and remain standing? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. Next, I ask Eidolene Kessner, Dean of the Indiana University Kelly School of Business, to present candidates for degrees. Will the candidates for bachelor's degree in the Kelly School of Business please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degrees in the Kelly School of Business please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the Kelly School of Business please stand? These candidates meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations, Kellys. Please be seated. I now ask Lemuel Watson, Dean of the School of Education, to present candidates for degrees. 
Will the candidates for the bachelor's degrees in the School of Education please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degrees in the School of Education please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for specialist degrees in the School of Education please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for doctorate degrees in the School of Education please stand? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. I now ask Raj Acharya, Dean of the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering, to come forward to present candidates for degrees. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degree in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for the doctoral degrees in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Engineering please stand? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. I now ask Gwen Richards, Dean of the Jacobs School of Music, to come forward once again to present candidates for degrees. Will the candidates for associate degrees in the Jacobs School of Music please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the Jacobs School of Music please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degrees from the Jacobs School of Music please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for the artist diploma and the performer diploma in the Jacobs School of Music please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the Jacobs School of Music please stand? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. Next, I call on Michael McGuire, Executive Associate Dean of the School of Public and Environmental Affairs to present degree candidates. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs please stand and remain standing? Will the candidate for master's degree in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs please stand? These candidates, meeting all the requirements for the degrees indicated are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Please be seated. I call on David Allison, Dean of the School of Public Health, to present degree candidates. Will the candidates for bachelor's degrees in the School of Public Health please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for master's degrees in the School of Public Health please stand and remain standing? Will the candidates for doctoral degrees in the School of Public Health please stand? These candidates, meeting all requirements for the degrees indicated, are recommended by the faculty for the conferral of these degrees. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. 
Please be seated. Thank you. It is now our pleasure to honor those who have earned doctoral degrees by placing upon them the doctoral hood. Faculty marshals will now lead the doctoral candidates to the stage where Provost Rebell, the deans, and I will greet them. They will, they will then receive their doctoral hoods from members of the faculty on the floor in front of the stage. Doctors' hoods are distinctive emblems of learning, edged in velvet and featuring colorful panels that symbolize the various disciplines. By observing the traditions of hooding, we honor the dedication and extraordinary effort that are required to earn a doctoral degree. Professor Carolyn Kellaway thomas will announce each school as its graduates come forward, and she will read the names of the doctoral candidates. We will begin with the doctoral candidates from the College of Arts and Sciences and Executive Dean Larry Singel. Duzal El Wikim, Jason Alexander Yoder, Michelle Monsung, Benita E. Rude. David. Toms, Lucera Sanchez Arachnik, Pauline Nelora Guerrera, Josie Ellen Tupolsky, Jessica Elizabeth Vadis. Kelly Petros, Jonathan Carl Anderson, Amanda Zock, Alexander Klein Anthony, Matthew J. Lubrezdo. Jill Renee Owen, Gary Kabowski, David A. Endicott, Noel Valerie Brown, Edgar Espinoza. William Ryan McConnell, Ivana Indera Singh, Mark Allen Moore, School of Education, Dean Lemuel Watson, Ron Roy. Melanie J. Robbins, Gina Rhodes, Chena Park, Jiun Choi, Yosin Asan. Oscar Sam Rodriguez, Neil Edward Klein, 
Stacy Lee Pinoval, Michael Lee Kersenlove, School of Informatics, Computing and Engineering, Dean Raj Acharya, Catherine Elaine Metcalf, Indiana University Jacobs School of Music, David H. Jacobs by Centennial Dean Gwen Richards, Jessica Ann Summer, Shin Yong No, Jason Ryan Jalika, Andrew Ross Bullion. William W. Kaler, Marquis Shawan Carter, Katie Elizabeth Chapman, Alexis Louise Witt, Heidi Ratke, School of Public Health, Dean David B. Allison. Stephen Ryan Herbold. Megan Kathleen Richards. Heather Monet Francis. Shirley Irene Payne. Now, will all candidates for all degrees please stand once again? <laughs> candidates. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the trustees of Indiana University, I am privileged to confer upon each and every one of you the degrees recommended by the faculty with all attendant rights and responsibilities. I now invite those of you who are receiving your first college degrees to show that you are truly graduates of Indiana University by moving the tassels on your caps to the left side. Congratulations.
Uh, please be seated. Please be seated. And so we come to the close of this memorable occasion. Our thanks go to our sign language interpreters, Kathleen Bennett and Barb Kane. Please join me in thanking our sign language interpreters. Our thanks also go to the members of the Indiana University Commencement Ensemble and conductor Eric Smedley, Associate Professor in our world-renowned Jacobs School of Music. Will all of our musicians please stand for our recognition as well. <laughs> Furthermore, we are grateful as always to the IU Bloomington Commencement Committee for all of their hard work in making today possible and so memorable. Well, please join me in thanking the Commencement Committee as well. We will close our ceremony by singing the alma mater, Hail to Old IU. And after the alma mater, I ask that our guests remain seated until all graduates have left the arena. Dean Richards will now lead us in song. And the words of the alma mater, for the very small number of you there who don't know the words, they're printed on the inside uh, of the front covers of your program booklets. Now, please, all who are able, please stand for the alma mater. Thank <laughs> you.